Good morning. This is the Indiana Civil Rights Commission Fair Housing and Race Training. So my name is Kylie Kramer. I work in external affairs as the public outreach and education manager for the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. And this is my colleague, Tracy. I'm Tracy Richardson. I'm the director of the ADR and uh, compliance department. I'm also a staff attorney with the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. Good morning. Thank you so much for signing up today and attending the Indiana Housing Community Development Authority IHCDA funded properties required fair housing training today. This training is brought to you by the Indiana Civil Rights Commission in partnership with IHCDA. During today's training, I'll call it two code words. Please write down these code words and any other notes that you feel necessary. At the end of this training, an email will go out to the email address that you use to register for this training today. The email will contain a link that you will use to verify today's attendance for today's training. Please click on the link, enter your information and the two code words from today's training. Follow up with Stephanie Sloan here at ICRC if you have any questions. Her cell phone number is 317-233-6144. Again, her cell phone number is 317-233-6144. So what we will be covering today is um, the ICRC mission, our jurisdiction, litigating with ICRC, fair housing laws, disparate treatment, disparate impact, as well as harassment. The Indiana Civil Rights Law gives ICRC jurisdiction to enforce equal opportunity in all five areas that include housing and real estate, employment, public accommodations, credit, as well as education. And then disclaimer, we are also not giving out legal advice today. This is just educational purposes. So again, going into the educational purpose um, here at ICRC, we are here to enforce, investigate, as well as educate. Enforcement can be these trainings as well as our laws that we follow here at ICRC, which we'll cover in the next slide. We also investigate, which goes under our intake and how a complaint goes through. ICRC and then education comes through me. The Indiana Civil Rights Commission does have enforcement authority over the Indiana Civil Rights Laws found in 229, as well as the Indiana Fair Housing Act at 229.5. So throughout that and with that enforcement authority, uh, a complaint can begin um, at the complaint process. If we establish jurisdiction, it goes through investigation. If there is a finding of cause, it will go to litigation um, when we begin. That is where we become an advocate. We also provide mediation services, but all of that is encompassed within our enforcement authority of the Indiana Civil Rights Law, as well as the Indiana Fair Housing Act. Both laws which mirror and reflect very closely uh, similar federal regulations under Title VII and Title VIII. And I do want to point out if you have any questions so far throughout this entire process, our Q&A section is open as of right now. So please be sure to ask any questions if you want anything that Tracy and I cover to go into more depth. Um, we do have a Q&A section at the very end, but if you want to go along and have any questions I don't want to remember for later, please put them in the Q&A section. And just to put in perspective, our, our reasoning for and our rationale for the creation for the enforcement of the laws, the investigation, and um, our, our duty uh, by statute to educate is, is for the purpose of the ending and the elimination of unlawful discrimination in the state of Indiana. That is the mission of our agency. Well put. And I think that goes into our importance and, and why we're here and why fair housing is something that we um, is one of our places of jurisdiction. It's uh, it's for security, stability and safety here in Indiana, including social and economic mobility and creating equal opportunity for all. Yes, um, we find that without that, um, when individuals um, don't have security, when they don't have stability, when there's not safety, social and economic mobility becomes very difficult. It's very difficult to establish, establish equal opportunity for all when you have individuals that don't have some of those basic needs that are met. And as, as has been taught, um, housing is a basic need for all individuals. 
And I think this goes along with this graph as our community is changing. As you can see from 1990 to 2030, which is coming up soon, uh, our, our communities are becoming more diverse. And I think this is why this is such a prevalent topic that we are discussing today. Um, race and ethnicity, it's, it's becoming even more prevalent in our area of jurisdiction in our communities. Yes, as um, populations uh, in the United States become more diverse, it becomes more apparent when there are issues of discrimination, whether that discrimination is based on race, whether it's national origin, whether it's sex or disability, it becomes apparent that that is not a positive um, for social mobility, for uh, social progression. So as our nation, as our population um, increases in diversity, it becomes more apparent of the need to protect the civil rights of all citizens. So Tracy will go into more detail about our, our areas of enforcement, our jurisdiction, but we follow the Indiana Civil Rights Law, the Indiana Fair Housing Act, and Title 910 of the Indiana Administrative Code. Yes, as discussed, the Indiana Civil Rights Law provides civil rights very similar to Title VII in uh, the Federal uh, Civil Rights Act. Um, Indiana Fair Housing was created specifically by law in the state of Indiana to mirror and grant the same rights and responsibilities as are under uh, Title VIII uh, federally. So um, we additionally follow uh, that federal guidance and guidelines from the HUD Department, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Very important that we um, protect those rights and responsibilities of individuals in the area of fair housing. And of course, our administrative code gives us and provides us the guidelines um, with which we enforce those Indiana civil rights laws. So our protected class is that the Indiana Fair Housing Act allows us to um, have jurisdiction over and, and says that a person may not be treated differently because of their race, religion, color, sex, disability, national origin, ancestry, and familial status in fair housing. And today we're really gonna focus on race. Yes, today we will be focusing on race. Um, one of the reasons we're focusing on race is because race is consistently one of the largest number of complaints that we receive uh, really across the board, not just in the area of fair housing, but also under our civil rights laws. Um, race and disability generally um, go back and forth uh, for the largest number of complaints. So it is something to keep on your radar, to be aware of, um, and to make sure that you have policies and procedures in place uh, that protect against um, having a complaint of race filed against you. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about things like implicit biases, and um, having some policies in place that may um, even inadvertently be uh, racially discriminatory and just being on the lookout uh, for those types of things and even training for staff uh, just to ensure that you don't fall in the traps of um, perhaps committing an act either inadvertently or intentionally, but being aware that that is a very large, we do receive a very large number of complaints uh, within fair housing based on race. Um, as Kylie mentioned, religion, um, and that's a sincerely held belief. So it's not necessarily one particular religion. Um, color is distinguished by literally the color of one's skin. Uh, so there are communities of color for which color discrimination is an issue. It can be an issue if it um, becomes a problem in any of our enforcement areas, uh, which includes fair housing. Uh, sex, we follow federal guidelines for what constitutes sex discrimination. Uh, that could be uh, either gender, uh, disability. Uh, we follow uh, federal guidelines as well for disability. And again, as she mentioned, national origin discrimination ancestry discrimination and in fair housing specifically, which is not found in our Indiana civil rights law, there is an additional protected class of familial status. 
So that's a very important component of fair housing as well. But just in our discussion of race, we kind of additionally touch on national origin and ancestry and color because at times um, a complaint that is filed uh, may include all of those factors or all of those protected classes. So when we talk about fair housing and, and who is subject to fair housing laws, uh, Tracy was saying earlier, it, it really is everyone. Um, and when, when we really look at it, it's it's sellers, it's landlords, leasing agents, homeowner associations, realtors, mortgage providers, and individuals themselves with discriminatory statements and interference. Yes, um, anyone can be subject to the Fair Housing Act, um, even if you have a corporation, a business entity, a partnership, because the Fair Housing Act does say persons, all persons um, are under this Fair Housing Act unless you meet a specific exemption. There are components of the act where you could find yourself to have committed a violation. So it's very important to know what uh, the exemptions are and what you're exempted from because there's almost no component in which uh, someone is completely exempt um, from the responsibilities of the Indiana Fair Housing Act. And particularly for you as housing providers, it's very important to know those touch points of potential liability. And this goes into who is not subject and the exemptions that Tracy was just speaking on. And um, this this has some give and take as well, um, but properties owned and controlled by religious organizations, private clubs not open to the public, housing for older persons with the 62 and over and the 55 and over, and Tracy can get more into that if you have questions on that. Uh, the Murphy exemption and, uh, and organizations not having racially discriminatory practices, and that's where the give and take is as well with, you can have a religious organization, but also be having racially discriminatory practices as well. Exactly, so although you may have some exemptions, from the Fair Housing Act, you're not going to be exempted from discriminatory statements. Um, you're not going to be exempted from things like interference or coercion uh, with an individual's right to use and enjoy fair housing. There are some things that have kind of a strict construction and um, having an exemption may not move you out of liability. Um, again, organizations, private organizations, religious organizations cannot have racially discriminatory practices even under their exemptions. Uh, with respect to housing for older persons, uh, 62 and over uh, state regulated, 55 and older with an 80% um, occupancy, uh, again, state regulated, they won't be subject to familial status um, discrimination complaints uh, because not based on those uh, rationale because they've been created. There's a special carve out within state law uh, for that type of housing. However, they could be subject to other things, racially discriminatory practices. They could be subject to um, disability complaints. So it, again, it's very important to understand and simply start with the basis I am covered. Um, I do fall under the Indiana Fair Housing Act. More than likely jurisdiction um, could be placed over my organization. There may be some areas of exemption, but it's best to start with the analysis that more than likely uh, will be covered. So it's important to know the act and to know what the violations of the act are. And we're going to quickly just cover how one can file. So any aggrieved person can file a complaint within the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. It, they have to show that they have been or will be injured by discriminatory housing practice. And this includes their housing organizations, testers, individuals of any race, and employee of, of a fair housing provider as well. Yes, and so when we talk about an aggrieved person, again, that's um, an individual who's shown that they are harmed. And when we talk about or will be harmed um, individuals that could potentially uh, have a violation under the Indiana Fair Housing Act, we do have temporary injunction authority. So there may be times that the Indiana Civil Rights Commission um, 
acts on a individual on their behalf when it appears that something is going to occur based on a discriminatory reason. Of course, we have to make all the necessary showings to prevail, but that is something the Indiana Civil Rights uh, Commission has the authority to do. Um, fair housing organizations do have uh, standing. It's been shown that they um, have standing based on their, um, their advocacy and their assistance that they provide to individuals who come to them when it comes to a point that they have to go over and above their mission to assist someone who's experiencing discrimination from a fair housing provider and they can show damage from increased costs or harm that are outside of their mission as a, as a result of having to work with that individual who's been harmed by a discriminatory act, uh, there can be liability. Uh, testers have standing, uh, they can file a complaint. So if you have an individual who is simply acting as a tester and um, organizations, fair housing providers should know that uh, there are advocacy organizations within the state of Indiana that have the authority and who do do testing. The Indiana Civil Rights Commission does testing. Again, the Supreme Court has said testers do have standing. There are um, areas where um, a tester may have actually experienced harm, even though they are not actually seeking housing, even though it is done uh, for testing purposes. There's a procedure and a process um, that has to be followed with those specific types of complaints those uh, procedures have uh, held up under the uh, court system. And so if there is real discrimination found, there is the potential for liability on the part of a housing provider. So again, um, individuals of any race can file a complaint uh, when we talk about, as we are gonna talk more about today, race discrimination. Race uh, discrimination can be found um, in a variety of ways. Uh, that can include someone in the Caucasian race. Again, there are certain uh, distinctions and certain things that have to be shown, but individuals of any race can file a complaint. Uh, employees of uh, housing providers have some protections under the Indiana Fair Housing Act, some specific uh, protections, particularly with respect to retaliation when they are attempting to work um, and work properly under the Indiana Fair Housing Act. So if you have an employee that has a question about a practice that appears to violate the Fair Housing Act and they experience retaliation, they may file a complaint uh, with our agency. Uh, that is a, a source of jurisdiction under the Indiana Fair Housing Act. And, and you kind of went into this a little bit, but these, these are the types of discrimination um, that are absolutely prohibited. Um, and we're gonna quickly go over these a little bit, but and we'll give some examples, but discriminatory statements, steering, blockbusting, Failure to accommodate or allow modifications, discriminating residential real estate transaction, intimidation or interference, which what we covered a little bit earlier, and denial as well. Yes, um, denial would probably be our, lar our largest complaint with respect to race discrimination, whether uh, we talk about denial in negotiations or denial um, actually in either sale for residential real estate or denial um, for rental. Um, we find at times there may be some practices where individuals of a specific race are being held to a higher standard, perhaps a higher credit score, um, a, a better rental history, um, being required to have a higher level of income, that type of thing. Those types of denials or, or simply not being allowed to negotiate at all um, not even receiving callbacks, um, not getting correct information as to availability. Um, and that, again, that's kind of where testing comes in because if you have a tester who's getting a very different response from an individual and that's based on race, uh, that definitely can form the basis of a complaint 
under the Fair Housing Act. Um, there have been issues of steering. You want to be very careful about allowing the individual that has come to you that is seeking housing to guide where they'd like to be and what type of housing they feel works for them and their family. Um, you don't want to be a housing provider that says, I think you'll be more comfortable over there because there are more people like you or because that's kind of your thought, even if it's not for purposes of discrimination, um, even if it's coming from what you perceive to be a good place that can be found to be steering. Uh, you don't want, um, and we touched on it a little bit, discriminating in residential real estate transactions that uh, covers a variety of residential real estate services. Again, whether it's credit history, some banking issues, um, requiring someone to be uh, better with respect to credit scores, um, income levels, et cetera, that is problematic and can be found to be discriminatory if it's based on one of our protected classes. But as we are discussing race today, you definitely want to be careful that not only in your transactions, but that in your policies that they are applied equally across the board. Um, also just want to touch on a little bit discriminatory statements. Discriminatory statements are not only making a statement, causing um, a statement to be made, and it also includes advertising. Uh, very important that you make sure your advertising does not give um, an indication to the standard as an ordinary listener that there is a preference, and that could be a preference for a specific uh, race. Um, so you don't want advertising that fails to show diversity. Uh, you don't want it to appear that you're only looking for a certain type of family. You don't want advertising that appears um, to show that you're only interested in an age category unless you are actually, uh, as we discussed, 62 and over, 55 and older, um, actual um, older person housing under our state laws. If you don't have that designation, or those designations. You don't want advertising that says something to the effect, we love our retirees, when you're not that those specific communities. Um, if you are not housing, dormitory housing, or specifically linked to a university, you don't want advertising. It's called student housing um, because all individuals have a right to, uh, to equal access to fair housing. So those are some of the types of discrimination that we particularly see in the area of race, discriminatory statements and advertising, uh, steering, denials, um, real estate transactions that you really want to be on the lookout for. I'm trying to bounce back. Um, and this is what you just discussed is very similar to our Federal Fair Housing Act as well. So there, there are some similarities between what we follow here um, state-wise and, and Federal Fair Housing Act-wise. So the protected classes, covering or covered housing providers, exemptions from act, the mission, who can file, theories of discrimination, and types of discrimination prohibited, all um, similar with Federal and State Fair Housing Act. We are going to take a quick second break. Um, there are no questions so far. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. I will say right now, your first code word is blockbusting. Blockbusting. So we're going to get into disparate treatment, disparate impact, as well as harassment and quickly cover these and then get into uh, racial discrimination as well. So with disparate treatment, it's an entity, when an entity treats people in a protected class differently than others not in that class. So it's 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 zeroing in on an individual and that's the big difference. Exactly, um, and again, that is one of the primary issues uh, that we have with race discrimination. Uh, is disparate treatment. When you have an individual who you don't have a policy in place, but you're simply treating individuals differently um, with respect to complaints that have been filed, uh, we have them in the area of fair housing again uh, in a variety of 
ways disparate treatment can be shown. Again, we talked about individuals being required uh, to have better um, tenant histories, um, individuals who can only have one by policy eviction on their record to be considered for a property, but um, one individual of a particular race because they have that one are not considered at all. They're not even negotiated with where the preferred race individual, that one does not exempt them from negotiations from that particular property. Again, credit scores or criminal histories. Um, we find and we often have in our filings instances where individuals are being denied um, either the ability to negotiate or being denied the housing altogether based on perhaps a credit score number that may not be as high as they would like, but should be high enough to uh, make them qualified to rent where we find um, other individuals again of another race that are treated disparately because they could have the same credit score or even lower but it was okay to negotiate with them and they were allowed um, to rent a particular property uh, the same thing um, when there is verification sometimes there are requests for income verifications some housing communities have some um, deviations or some exceptions with employment verifications that they allow. We've had cases where individuals, uh, certain individuals of particular races were allowed to utilize certain types of documentation for income verification, but individuals of um, another race perhaps were not allowed to use that type of documentation for income verification. So again, not necessarily um, a policy in place that is affecting a large number of individuals, but individually um, people are simply being treated differently. And that's the key. If you are going to have policies or if you are going to have exceptions to your policies, it's important that you apply those exceptions equally. Now, there's some understanding that sometimes there are some different fact scenarios, but what you don't want to have are circumstances where you have consistently applied exceptions to some requirements to a very similar race of individuals, and it's showing that you are not applying those exceptions to individuals of another race. It's really better to simply be across the board and as much as possible um, to apply your policies very equally so you don't run into complaints for race discrimination. I think Tracy covered so many great examples of disparate treatment and one that we have up here that's specific to race is allowing a Caucasian tenant to rent on a month-to-month -month basis when lease expires, but not allowing the same tenancy arrangements for an Asian immigrant family, things of that nature. Yeah, and sometimes it, it just should be apparent, important to note um, some individuals or housing providers might have uh, what they believe are business reasons for doing certain things. Uh, we've heard a lot of business reasons, but you want to be careful that you're business reasons or your attempts to be uh, efficient or to save money um, in ways that you think are okay. You want to make sure that those ways are not stepping on the rights of individuals under the Fair Housing Act. And the biggest difference between disparate treatment and impact is the, the rule and, and the neutral rule. So when an entity employs a facially neutral rule, policy, or practice, that results in different outcomes negatively toward a practice or a protected class. So an example of this is, and you found one that was a little bit better than you like. Yeah, um, because as, as we talked about, disparate impact really does not specifically target any of our protected classes. And as this one discusses, uh, families with children are protected class. So this is really not the best example of disparate impact. Disparate impact would be you have a policy that's just a straight policy across the board. Uh, you may say something to the effect, um, we only uh, rent 
uh, to individuals who can uh, show that they've previously lived in this particular county. Well, if that particular county is about 95% Caucasian, and those are the only rental applications you're accepting, it may appear that you are attempting to limit um, the particular race of individuals who are living in your unit because um, that um, particular policy, which is not um, indicating any of our protected classes, is going to have an application that is going to um, prohibit a larger number of protected classes um, from being able to file um, and successfully apply for that housing if that's your rule. So um, other rules uh, we've seen um, that have a, a negative impact on a particular protected class include um, you have to have, you have to show income verification by employment in this particular county. Um, again, if um, someone is employed in that particular county and that particular county is 90, 95% Caucasian or a particular race that is being preferred, again, you are limiting um, and basically prohibiting without actually using the term, um, we're prohibiting a particular race. So even in your creating policies um, that appear neutral, make sure that they don't have a negative impact on a particular group that's under our protected classes because you could be subject to a complaint filing. So we're gonna briefly go over harassment and then we're gonna give a few quick examples. And during those examples, we ask that you put your answer in the chat and explain why uh, your answer is the way that it is. Uh, so harassment can take a variety of forms under the Indiana Fair Housing Act. It can be sexual harassment, housing provider on tenant, tenant on tenant, and even as far as criminal harassment as well. So forms of harassment can be hostile environment or quid pro quo, which is unwelcomed, and they've made it very, uh, very apparent that it is clearly unwelcome conduct. And so when we talk about harassment, obviously when we talk about quid pro quo, we talk about um, housing providers um, assisting perhaps a tenant, saying if you need some help in a particular area, um, if you give me this or that, and that could be anything from sexual favors, sexual harassment. Um, otherwise, I'm not going to assist you. I'm not going to perhaps repair something that I'm required to repair that you need. Um, your stove is, is not working. And the um, housing provider has made that uh, clear to the tenant. And the tenant has made it clear that this is not welcome conduct. Um, if a hostile environment is created, and it's very important that your staff uh, treat your tenants, um, again, in a way that's equal across the board, that there are not particular tenants that would say, um, I see other tenants in the unit, um, I see their repairs being done, I see them being treated fairly, uh, they feel welcome when they come into um, the uh, property management area, I see tenants particularly as we discuss race, and, and there are a variety of race complaints that we get where uh, we are told that uh, tenants of a particular race are spoken to a certain way, tenants of a particular race are treated a certain way when they come into the uh, management areas to have discussions, uh, tenants of a particular race, uh, their repair requests are treated a certain way that can be seen as harassment as well. Um, if it's done consistently and the environment begins to feel hostile for a particular individual. So it's important uh, to steer clear of that and um, to treat your tenants the same and with the same policies with respect to repair, with respect to filing complaints, with respect to speaking to management um, with questions or concerns, with respect to the rules that govern um, your property. Um, very important that all that is applied equally um, to your tenants. 
So this goes into harassment and where it's found in the Indiana Code. So it's intimidation or interference with exercise of another's rights. And I don't know if you've seen. It. And, and and again, and we've kind of discussed it. This is the actual statute under the Fair Housing Act that kind of governs it. And we call it an intimidation or interference with the exercise of one's right to use or enjoy fair housing. And so um, many of the activities that we've discussed can be covered under this particular statute. And it's also important to note that as we talked about, there is tenant on tenant harassment that occurs. Um, there are times obviously when tenants don't get along, but when it becomes intimidating, when it becomes threatening, when it becomes, um, when it rises to the level that it begins to interfere with a particular tenants um, enjoyment of their housing and that tenant has come to you as a housing provider and said, I am having an issue with this individual, my family or my children are having an issue with this individual. It is consistent. We feel like it's harassment. It is very important that you as a housing provider take that seriously and that you follow steps to ensure that that individual is not um, breaking the law with respect to harassment because if it is found that you as a housing provider are not following through our, on complaints, if that harassment is based on any of our protected classes, and that could be anything from disability to familial status to sex, and as we are discussing today, it could be race, someone that um, comes to you and complains, about uh, racial discrimination, consistent racial discrimination, uh, names that becomes threatening behaviors, and they have complained to you and told you this is occurring. I'm concerned it has risen to this level that I am not able to enjoy fair housing. Um, you could additionally be held liable for that tenant's behavior. So it really is important that you take those complaints seriously and that you investigate them and ensure that your tenants are also not engaging in harassment. So that is not um, assessed against you and you don't become liable. I mean, this goes further into federal, the federal civil counterpart of harassment and the definition where it is in both state and federal as well. And as we discussed, um, the housing rights in the state of Indiana mirror and reflect the housing rights that are provided um, under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And this can go as far as criminal, as we said, the criminal is one of the forms in which harassment can, can go up to. Um, again, it's the same same language as intimidation and interference in the exercise of those rights, and, but this classifies an offense. So it's under criminal statute. And as, as you have said, it, it, it can go as far as department, it can go to the Department of Justice. And right, the federal, for the federal statute, um, there can be a um, referral to the uh, Department of Justice. The Indiana Civil Rights Commission does have the authority to refer that type of harassment um, to the prosecutor's office. So um, when it becomes violent, um, when there are threats of violence, acts of violence, when it rises to that level of intimidation, um, just know that that harassment can be criminal and can be referred uh, to the prosecutor's office. So it's very important to ensure that that doesn't occur, particularly based on our protected classes. And again, as we are discussing race today, that does include um, intimidations based on race. And again, federal law section, it, it goes into um, us quoting a section and again, similar language as well. And this is just determining harassment. So what we look at here at ICRC when uh, we see a harassment case, it's the nature of the conduct, the context, severity, scope, frequency, duration, location, and relationship of the persons involved. So again, I said that we are gonna go into some real life scenarios and we'll cover a few here. Um, and again, answer in the Q&A section and, and explain it if you feel necessary. Um, but a landlord continues to make unwelcome frequent visits to a single tenant's property. Tenant has requested the landlord to email or call if there are any further issues the landlord would need to visit tenant's property. Landlord continues to make unwelcome visits and dismisses tenant's request. This is a form of sexual harassment.
and you're going to be putting that in the chat. Yes. while they're typing maybe you can give your analysis of this really quickly and and again we just kind of look at um, the definition of, mm -hmm. of harassment is is that uh, some unwelcome activity has someone said to that uh, housing provider this is this is making me uncomfortable this is not uh, the way i want you to behave and again we're going to kind of look at uh, whatever the basis of these frequent visits if these are required visits because of something occurring within the property that's necessary obviously that's a different thing um, but if these are unnecessary visits if these have nothing to do with um, the business of the property if it's not for repair if it's not for something that is uh, perhaps going on across the unit that's necessary um, that, that could definitely be a problem. So it's really important that you are not crossing lines of uh, sexual harassment. And we've gotten a lot of responses and you are all correct so far. So thank you for your analysis and answering that. Uh, this could be um, another one that, that we see and this will be our last one. We're gonna take a, a quick break. Uh, tenant, upon realizing that there is a new immigrant family next door to tenant, consistently files complaints against immigrant family because of the smell of their food and volume of their dialect. Tenant has made unkind comments about immigrants. Immigrant family has complained to property manager. Property manager then replies, people have a right to their own opinions. Is this harassment? And again, while they're putting that in the chat, you'd like to do your analysis. And, and so we're just asking, is this harassment? Is this harassment um, based on the behavior of the tenant? Um, is this harassment that uh, the property owner could be held liable for? What is the frequency um, of these filings? How often are they doing these filings? And what are they filing? Are there real um, violations of the tenant lease? Or are there just filings because there are issues that perhaps the other tenant is not comfortable with, is not used to, and doesn't like? Um, are these personal types of filings? Are they becoming um, disruptive? Are they causing issues with that particular family? Are there threats being made? Are they being made to feel intimidated? Um, those. Uh, can be important issues to consider. So it, it could be harassment. It depends, obviously, on other uh, circumstances. There are a great deal of fact scenarios that go into the determination of harassment. But again, as we talked about, um, when it comes to race, um, we said national origin kind of touches on some other issues. Um, the kind of issues that come because of race discrimination also frequently come up because of national origin or ancestry discrimination where we have individuals with impl implicit biases or stereotypes or just are not used to uh, different lifestyles um, and because of their opinions or their desires may treat individuals a particular way but if that treatment is becoming intimidating, if it's becoming harassing, then uh, it is important for you as a housing provider, again, to take a complaint seriously of individuals who are who feel they are being harassed based on a protected class status and do some investigation to be sure that that's not occurring. And we are going to cover implicit bias and things of that nature for those who don't know what implicit bias means or, or how that can affect um, how we treat people daily. Uh, that, that will be coming up soon. We're going to quickly cover emotional support animals so we can move on to race and race discrimination. Uh, so some differences that we have from the Federal Fair Housing Act is, is covering emotional support animals or also called ESAs. So Indiana does have ESA legislation and the legislation makes re misrepresentation of an ESA class A infraction. Uh, ESA legislation is found in the Indiana Civil Rights Law, not the Fair Housing Act. Yes, and, and we simply touch on that. We know this is a race discrimination presentation, but wanted to kind of discuss um, at all if there are any differences. Again, Indiana has really attempted to make a point to mirror that Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, the only place really where 
well, I won't say the only place, there are distinctions. Uh, there are uh, differences in the federal uh, with respect to how far um, the number of protected classes, some distinctions with respect to that. But a real distinct point would be our emotional support animal legislation. And that is because it has some um, touch points with respect to making misrepresentation a class A infraction. Indiana is one of the few states um, in the country that has that. Um, so that is one of our distinctions. And we, again, don't have um, any questions. We have everyone responding to our questions, which we greatly appreciate. So with no further questions, we're going to move on so we can end in time. Uh, so we're going to get into fair housing and race discrimination. So uh, again, Trace is at the beginning of this. It's not just race. It goes into color and as well as national origin, and sometimes ancestry as well. And, and we did in, in 2020, we had 143 cases just to do with race discrimination. And, and just kind of to clarify, race discrimination um, is a protected class in and of itself. But again, kind of the same issues that could bring about a race discrimination complaint are some of the same issues that could bring about a national origin or color complaint. And as Kylie mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit more about implicit biases and stereotypes. Um, so it is important that not only as housing providers, that implicit biases and stereotypes uh, that they don't govern not only your policies, but the way you act and react with uh, tenants or potential uh, purchasers uh, in real estate transactions, that those don't come into play because uh, race discrimination, but also color and national origin discrimination uh, can be affected by those uh, attitudes. And again, as you said, not everyone may realize that they have an implicit bias and, and kind of what we've been covering. So sometimes your rules and policies and how you create your mannerisms with people and your tendons might not always be malicious, but it can come from implicit bias. And, and that is simply the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decision and decisions in an unconscious manner. So implicit bias can come from unconscious and automatic mannerisms. They are malleable, which means that they can change as you grow and as you age. Uh, they have real world effects on your behavior, again, with how you understand and act toward people. They may not always align with your explicit beliefs, and they are pervasive as well. And I, uh, we think that's a really important point, the real world effects on behavior. Um, Again, when we talked about policies uh, being applied disparately to certain individuals because there just seems to be, oh, I've got a good feeling. I think they're going to be OK. They may have had a criminal history past, but I believe they've reformed. They seem to have a nice family. Uh, we hear that a lot. They're a nice family. Um, and then and another individual who, again, may have the same types of qualifications when it comes to the numbers, when it comes to credit scores. Um, when it comes to employment history, uh, but they may also have a criminal history because the difference is race. Um, I, I just don't know if I feel good. I, I'm not feeling very comfortable. I'm concerned with the kind of people they're going to be bringing over that are going to be around. I just, I'm not feeling good about that. So it's important to understand that that is um, an implicit bias that may be unconscious that could affect um, the way you govern yourself um, under uh, or as a housing provider, but could really be a violation of the Indiana civil rights law because within your business, you are governed by a set of laws that says that uh, making these types of distinctions is illegal. Um, so it's important to remember that it is a law. And um, although you may have that implicit bias, it's important to put that aside and say, but I need to make a better business judgment. So we're going to uh, just look at this comment really quickly um, and then move forward more with racial and, and other uh, real life scenarios. Uh, a landlord persistently makes unwelcome lewd comments about a resident's body. Is this harassment? Again, you can put in chat, you've all been great about putting things in the chat. Um, and I, I think 
this is a pretty obvious one, um, but this is a form of harassment, yes. Uh, and 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 just to bring it to race, you could change it and say a landlord persistently makes unwelcome um, and unkind comments about a particular race of people um, and maybe kind of laughs it off as a joke. Um, but every time they're around a particular tenant or the tenant comes around, um, perhaps the tenant has to bring in a payment for whatever reason or whenever they're um, in the tenant's unit doing a repair, um, whenever there's that contact or when the tenant calls, there's uh, some type of comment um, about that tenant's race or about people of that tenant's race. Um, and the tenant has actually said, you know, I'm not really comfortable with you saying that. To, it seems like every time I come around, you seem to feel a need to say something. Um, and and it may even be innocuous. Um, did you, I don't know, um, it could be a variety of things, but things that kind of have a racial tone um, and perhaps a negative racial tone. Um, would that be consist considered harassment? And again, there, there aren't hard and fast answers to anything because the courts have to look at a variety of facts. Uh, they're going to look at persistent um, and how frequently it occurs. Um, they're going to look at the types of things that were said. They're going to look at um, the effect um, that the individual had, had on that individual, subjective as well as objective. They're going to look at whether or not that ind individual said, hey, I'm, I'm not real comfortable with that. I don't like that. Or again, as we spoke about a tenant that has said, um, you have uh, my next door neighbor constantly. This is constantly going on. They make comments to my children when they go out to the school bus. They're, they're generally racially derogatory or, or stereotypical. Um, they kind of go out of their way. We've asked them to stop. It's continuing. Um, they kind of do strange things. Um, they blocked our, our cars as we've attempted to park. Um, they've kind of made things difficult for us, made us feel uncomfortable. They stare at us as we go in and about our day uh, with a group of people. Um, they kind of appear to be talking about us, that type of thing. So a lot of fact scenarios will go into it. But you, again, you want to be careful that you and your staff are not engaging in that kind of behavior. And at the same time, you want to be careful if you're getting reports for that type of behavior that you are investigating it and ensuring that there are no violations of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and this goes into what we were saying earlier. So our disparate treatment and disparate impact. So recalling some information from earlier, Acme Apartments has a policy that only that will only rent to people who are employed. Disparate treatment, disparate impact. And remember, one has to do with policy and one has to do with more of how we're treating the individual. Do you would like to explain this? So this would be, um, again disparate impact and we kind of talked about that earlier because it's not indicating or implicating any protected class it's just kind of a general across the board policy and it's very easy to say well we apply this to everyone but the issue is not whether you apply it to everyone the issue is who is it impacting so if it's impacting a specific group and that group is a protected class then there could be a complaint filing because there could be an argument made that either intentional or unintentional, this has a discriminatory and unlawful discriminatory effect um, on one of the protected classes in the state of Indiana. And so this is a policy that may need some tweaking. Um, a policy of only renting to people who are employed may um, have a disparate impact on uh, the disabled population who may have the income that's necessary to make that rental payment. Uh, some properties uh, also use other things as verification of income, and they may have some additional income. So to say I cannot rent to you because you don't have um, this particular type of employment could be found to be discriminatory 
um, could be found to have a disparate impact on a particular group. So again, make sure your policies don't exclude or disparately or disproportionately negatively impact one uh, particular protected class, because again, you could be subject to a complaint filing. And this one also, uh, again, with a, a racial uh, real life scenario with disparate impact or treatment. An African American male submits a maintenance request to his landlord due to a broken air conditioner. A Caucasian female also submits a maintenance request due to a broken air conditioner. Landlord quickly responds to the female's request and repairs her air conditioner. It does not fix the African American male's air conditioner. Is this disparate impact or disparate treatment? Second. And this is our last example, and Tracy can explain her analysis on this. And again, as we've discussed, uh, disparate treatment is individualized. So it's not when you have a policy that is affecting uh, or a neutral policy affecting a specific protected class. It's when um, you are treating an individual of a specific protected class differently. Now, obviously, this is a very general scenario, but if we kind of boil down to the same uh, and more specific types of things, perhaps we said the African American male submitted their maintenance request um, four months ago, um, submitted a second follow up um, two months after the maintenance request and hadn't heard anything. Um, made a couple of phone calls and spoke to the head of maintenance. Um, it's the middle of summer, um, said uh, my family, you know, I have an infant, um, it's very warm in our apartment, we're continuing to pay our rent and no one has come to repair, no one has come to fix. Um, we'll get to you, we'll get to you, there is a waiting list. Uh, we only have, um, we have a small maintenance staff, but we will get to you. Um, two months after the phone conversation, still no repair. And a Caucasian female submits maintenance requests due to a broken air conditioner. Um, it's uh, early spring or late winter, February, and just notices the air conditioner wasn't blowing. Um, I need to have this done. I'd like to have it done right away. Obviously, uh, it's gonna be getting warmer. Uh, three weeks later, the repair is done. So that uh, kind of puts it more into perspective, but those are the types of requests um, or complaints that uh, we hear about. Um, uh, obviously, fact scenarios will make a determination as to whether or not there was true uh, disparate uh, treatment um, that was given, but this isn't an example of impact, but treatment because it appears someone is being treated differently as a tenant and it appears just based on the fact that there are distinctions um, in race that the different treatment is based on that race. Of course, um, a landlord can make a um, argument to try to rebut that presumption, but just uh, factually, if a court were to find that there is what we call a comparator, that is being treated better. And the only reason, again, we're doing this based on race, but it could be in any area of our protected class. But if you're treating someone differently and it's shown that you're treating someone differently better, and it appears to be that the only difference is race, you could be subject uh, to a complaint filing. So our last slide before we get into the Q&A is just prevention. So know and follow your fair housing laws. Housing providers should know their responsibilities under the Indiana Fair Housing Act. Train their employees on the Indiana Fair Housing Act to prevent such cases from starting and ending up in Indiana civil rights. Should comply with all fair housing posting requirements and it should include policies and their tenant lease agreements as well. And this is now our Q&A session. We, we have one question right now. Um, and before I get into that, we have our final code word, which is national origin. National origin. 
So uh, one person wrote in and they said that they have a couple of residents that are, are making written com complaints about each other. Um, if they go with what one says, the other is clearly being harassed. I feel as though there's a fine line just being overtly reactive because they just don't like each other. I'm struggling to handle the situation. And so we, uh, and again, just want to throw in our disclaimer that we didn't throw, I, I think we did yep. throw it in. Mm -hmm. We did say this is not legal advice. We cannot provide legal advice. Um, this is purely for educational purposes. Um, so basically what we can say is what is important for you as a housing provider is to do your due diligence, to listen when a tenant um, says they are being harassed, to do whatever investigation or what in, whatever investigatory uh, policies and procedures you have in place to make a determination. Um, it's it's good perhaps to have some policies um, in place in your tenant um, leases or your rules and rights and responsibilities and to ensure uh, that there aren't tenants who are violating any of those. If there are violations, attempt to apply whatever you apply with respect um, to uh, consequences equally. Um, that type of thing, uh, I, I, we couldn't obviously, without knowing that particular scenario, get, tell you where that's going to go. But what we could say is that it is important as a fair housing provider that you do your due diligence, that you pay attention um, to ensure that there are no fair housing violations or that it doesn't appear that there's harassment based on any protected class status. And so it's important that you know what those protected classes are. And if anyone has any further questions, uh, this is my contact information and the Indiana Civil Rights Commission's contact information. Um, my email is up there. And if you have any questions whatsoever, if you find that you have more questions throughout today or have any questions on our training, uh, please call 317-232-2600. That is our front office, and they can get you in contact with the right person. Thank you so much for attending today. We hope you learned a lot and took some notes. Again, make sure to follow up. You received your email two minutes ago from the Indiana Civil Rights Commission regarding how you will enter in your code words today. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. And we thank you for your participation.